Well, it's so good to be here with you this morning on the Hosanna Fellowship Program. And wow, what a treat we have today. Uh, I, I get to introduce to you my dear friend and co-worker, co-laborer here at Hosanna for many years, uh, Joe Ewan. So Joe, it's great to have you here on the on the, the Hosanna Fellowship Program this morning. And you're not local, you actually live, where do you live? I live in the northeast of Scotland. Uh, we call it the ends of the earth because there's nothing between us and the North Pole. Wow, there you go. Gosh, we've, been, we've known each other now for over 20 years and you've been a, a, a real precious part of the church life here at Hosanna. Uh, you also serve a, in an oversight role for uh, this church and we're so glad to have had this relationship over the years and uh, I'm, I'm, I really have, uh, am excited to have you on the program this morning because one of the things that we've been talking about, uh, gosh, for half a year now is uh, the fact that lives and culture can be transformed by the proclamation of truth and love. And we know that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And that Romans tells us that God demonstrated his love for us and that he sent his son. So we know that Jesus Christ is love and truth. And, and you have an amazing testimony too. How did you come to Christ? I mean, being there in Scotland, what, what was your, what's your story? Well, I, I came to the Lord um, as a, a little boy, about maybe five, six years old, when, you know, I used to go to church, church on Sunday morning and then Sunday school and then in the afternoon, I went to a Brethren Church Sunday School. And it was there that I had given my life to the Lord when I was a kid. Well, I left school just before, maybe six weeks before my 15th birthday, and went on a fishing boat with my dad, my brother, my cousin, and another guy. And um, I became a fisherman. I went for a month. I went for my summer vacation time to see if I was going to be able to do it. And so I did that for 17 years. And eight of those years, I owned my own 70-foot trawler. Now, you're, you're talking to people primarily that are here in East Tennessee. And when we think fishing boat, we're thinking of a little John boat that we put out on, on the lake, or we're, we're thinking about maybe a ski boat that someone gets in. Explain to me just a little bit about what a, a trawler is and what is what you were fishing for. Yeah, well, we fished in the North Sea. It's uh, quite renowned for bad weather and stuff. And so we were able to build a 70-foot trawler. It was a wooden oak, oak beams, oak, oak uh, wooden trawler. And, um, and so it had a caterpillar engine, 420 horsepower. And uh, we fished what we call sand net fishing in the North Sea. Um, and we would fish for cod, haddock, um, sole, halibut, all these different kinds of mainly bottom fish because we fished in the bottom of the sea. Wow. I, I, I've only seen pictures of, of, of people like on those boats in the middle of these big, huge waves. Is that something that you, you faced as a fisherman? I mean, uh, I mean, I, I can't imagine what that would be like. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah. Faced those a few times. There was maybe a couple of times that, uh, is this it? Um, you know, with big waves and stuff. But the boats that they built back in those days were, you know, they were very, very strong. And, you, you, you know, you, you were, they were very buoyant. Um, and, you know, we were always, you know, we, we trusted what we had underneath us, really. Wow. So now you have a family. Tell us a little bit about your family. Yeah, I'm married to Yvonne. We've been married 49 years this year. Oh, and we have two daughters, Leslie, who is one of the head nurses in an ICU unit down in Edinburgh, Scotland, which is a very responsible job as you can imagine at the moment with COVID and all that stuff. And uh, she's married to Paul. Paul's an engineer. They don't have any children, but uh, yeah, they're doing well. And then my other daughter, Sarah, she lives in Sydney, Australia. She's a real entrepreneur, runs a couple of her own businesses over there. 
and their leadership training and stuff like that. Um, so she's doing well, not married yet, but um, she's a great girl too. Oh, that's great. Well, now tell me, I mean, you, you, were, you were on a boat, you had your own, you had your own trawler, you had a successful fishing business, I think. And so uh, why did you leave the fishing business? What happened? Well, <clears throat> it was 1977 um, and Yvonne had read The Cross and the Switchblade uh, we were in the Presbyterian church. She got saved. Um, and, you know, and just after we got married, we got married in 72. But, and, and then we, we started to grow a little bit in the Presbyterian church. But then she went and got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she put, she, uh, put this question to me one day. And she said, you say that you are a Christian but you're not very enthusiastic, are you? Um, which led to a little intense fellowship around the place. And uh, so, yeah, and I, I knew, I knew that I, I was doing things in the church, but I wasn't really, I was a scared uh, Christian, and if I can put it that way. And, uh, and so what happened was I went to see, and uh, on a Monday morning in May, 1977, and she had given me a New Testament to read. And I was reading John 15, verse 6. Any branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he cuts it off and throws it in the fire. Now, I had no theology, none whatsoever. But to me, I had a fear of the Lord experience in the middle of the North Sea. I proved Psalm 139 to be absolutely true, that even if I go to the remotest part of the sea, the Lord is there. And I met God in a powerful way on the bridge of my fishing boat. The little New Testament grew red hot in my hand. I threw it down. I couldn't hold it. And I just knew that God was filling the place. So it was, I worked all week. And in the midst of this, I came home at the weekend, met with some people from Youth with a Mission at that time. They'd, they'd been uh, the ones that Yvonne had been fellowshipping with and got filled with the Spirit. And uh, they, we just talked. I wanted to know how you heard God's voice from them. You know, I just asked them the questions and that. And then we went to bed and it was about midnight. Now, I was a very shy, um, re reserved Presbyterian, you know. Um, but anyway, I'm, we're lying in bed about midnight. And all of a sudden, I, me, I started to shout, hallelujah, praise the Lord. In the midst of we were praying. And I just shouted it out. And then all of a sudden, I began to shake all over. And then the room filled with a blinding light. And I had this blinding light experience of the Lord um, in my bedroom, midnight on a Saturday night. And um, what I didn't realize till a long time later was that Jesus actually came, baptized me in the Holy Spirit, and he never even asked me. <laughs> so that was that was it i went to the presbyterian church the next day and yvonne's trying to hold me down i wanted to get up and shout something dramatic had changed in my life and she said oh please she's holding on to my coat because we used to dress up in those days you know uh -huh. and 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 she's holding on to my coat she said oh please don't jump jump up and please don't shout you know and she had been praying before that Lord, could you make him a little more enthusiastic? Well, our prayer actually changed that day. And she said, Lord, I wanted him a little bit more enthusiastic, but this might be too much now. <laughs> so that was it. And that was the uh, life-changing moment when everything inside me that had been sown through the years, even up through Sunday school, came alive. Wow. How old were you then when that happened? Oh, oh, uh, I'm, I must have been about uh, 29, something like that. Wow. So 29 years you've been living, just doing your own thing, kind of, you know, trying to succeed in business and had a little family. And, and then all of a sudden, Jesus just, he just made himself real and, and he, he yeah. changed yeah. everything. Changed everything. What happened after that? What, I mean, what did you do with your fishing business then? Well, I, I, I carried on for a couple of years. I would preach the gospel over the, the radio telephone and stuff like that. And 
and uh, talk to guys about the Lord. Um, but then just, you know, we were going to a charismatic church. We'd left the Presbyterian church. We'd actually gone to YWAM to do a discipleship training course. Now, what you um, mean YWAM, what is YWAM? YWAM, that's Youth with a Mission, it's called. And uh, they, they train young people to go on mission and stuff. And uh, so we went for three months. I had another guy take my over my boat for, for that time. And we went to the south of England, joined this team. And then we went for a month's outreach to Barcelona in Spain. Wow. And then when we got back, we stayed in the Presbyterian church, but it came a little untenable because, you know, just the way things were, the pastor didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, da 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 da, -da you know, all that stuff. So uh, we went to a charismatic church, um, but then the Lord said to me this, lay down your nets and follow me. Well, I mean, you couldn't get it more literal than that. I mean, he said that to another fisherman too, didn't he? Yeah, I kind of said it to a, another guy. Yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting him one day. <laughs> well, that man, what, that's exciting. So you laid down your nets and you said, okay, Jesus, now what? What happened? Yeah, well, we, we were in this church. I was an elder of the church and we had started a group. We had about 20 people meeting in our home. Uh, here and and we lived in a place called Macduff at that time just about a mile from where we are now and um, and you know we were meeting as a life group and then uh, things just didn't go too well in that church and the next we knew we had we were starting a church um, it'll be 40 years old in 2022. Wow um, and uh, so you, you'll be coming over for that um, and we're going to have a big celebration. So, yeah, and uh, we started this work um, and, and back then, 1981, 1982. So here you are, good little Presbyterian boy, not really, you know, grew up in the church, had an experience with the Lord early on in your life, but then it could just kind of go on your own way, become a, a commercial fisherman, uh, you, you knew about Jesus. You were in church every Sunday, generally. I mean, you would be gone during the week, come back on the weekends, be with your family. You have this, you have this dramatic encounter as a result of your own wife really challenging you and you reading the scripture. God shows up in the, on the boat, basically, out in the middle of the North Sea. And, and at 29 years of age, you said, yes, Jesus, whatever. And for two years, you kind of continued on. But then he said, lay down your nets and you started a church and you became a pastor. Yeah. You went from being a fisherman to a pastor overnight. Overnight. Well, Peter went from a fisherman and became an apostle overnight. Right. You know? <laughs> but that's, a, that's a transforming work, isn't it? I mean, we're talking about well, you know, Jesus yeah. changing people's lives. I mean, it's amazing. And I just got to be honest, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I went through a wilderness. The Lord had to refine my heart. You know, I'd, I had a friend that came to visit one day and I said, look, we got to pray and you got to get a word, a prophecy for me. Speak some encouragement into my heart. He was a younger man than me, uh, a very educated guy, a nice guy. And, uh, um, and so he said, okay, let's pray. So we prayed and he said, I've got a word for you. I said, oh, great, great. This is good. And he said, you're a hard man. I said, this is supposed to be encouraging. <laughs> you know, that's not very encouraging. And then he said, you've had to harden your face to go to sea because of rough weather. You've had to harden your emotions to leave your family every Sunday night to, mm -hmm. to go to sea. You've, you've, you, you become hardened because of the elements, you know, the weather and the whole thing. You've lived in a confined space with seven men, ungodly men, um, that don't know the Lord. And you've had to harden yourself in, in that, and fence yourself around for the sake of your faith. And God's dismantling all that in this season of your life. And that was one of the most amazing words I've ever had. I understood why 
I was having a Moses type experience, not a 40 year one like Moses, but it was like a seven year one for me. Wow. So, so then after that, things began to open up for you. What, I mean, what, what, because you, you were in youth with a mission, which is a mission organization. It's, it's meant to encourage, uh, first of all, discipleship, train young people, but then it really is to send them out on the mission field to share the gospel, to share the work of Christ, to proclaim truth and love. But, but then as a pastor and working with the local church, the Lord really opened up doors for you. Tell me, tell me a little bit what's happened since that time. What, what, what has God done in Joe Ewan uh, since you said yes and laid down your nets? Well, um, when I was in YWAM, um, you know, that was in 1979. This was 77. I had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, I never knew squat, you see. So I'm in this discipleship training. And there was one of these leaders would walk through the corridors of this place. And every time he passed me, he would say, oh, here's the prophet from the north. And I would scratch my head. And I remember going back to this room that Yvonne and I were staying in with our baby at that time, Leslie. And I would say, that's that guy again. And he's saying, here's a prophet from the north. I'm not making any prophet here. My boat's up in the northeast of Scotland. <laughs> I didn't know what a prophet was. And then, you know, what they did was they had this guy who prophesied and they called him a prophet, would come in, came in amongst the students. And I'm just standing there and he walks up to me and said, have you ever prophesied? I said, no. He said, why? I said, well, I don't know. And he laid hands on me in 1979. And next I know I'm lying on the ground. And he said, when I tell you, you will prophesy. And I'm sitting there scratching my head, trying to make it sound religious, you know, thus saith God, you know, a little bit of, I'd see, I heard a little bit of a Pentecostals by that time. I'll say, are you and, from East Tennessee? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go ahead. And, and uh, so, you know, it was, he, he then called me over and he had me prophesy over a guy for the first time. And I've never stopped doing it since. You know, mm. I read Keith Green's last newsletter mm. and it was about going to the, the nations. Keith Green was a prophetic guy. He got killed in an airplane and a great singer, great songs. You can Google them, great songs, still but great songs. Anyway, he, he had this newsletter and that was really encouraging people to go to the mission field. And God spoke to me, it was a Sunday morning. And he said, you are gonna go to the mission field. Uh, you're gonna be a ascending church. You're gonna send people out to the mission field, but you're going first because you need to know what it is to lay hands on someone and send them out into the field um, so that you can do it with some conviction in your own heart. So that started me off. I went to India with a friend back in 1984, and I went to India every year, maybe once or twice a year, up until 1999. And then in between that, I met this guy, Jimmy Seibert. He's a, he's a guy from Waco, Texas, a big church now, and the organization called Antioch. Um, um, and, um, you know, we... I got linked in with this young man and was like a pastor to him. That's what he would say. Um, and I started to go on mission to him. So I, I then started to go to Russia, Mongolia, Thailand, Mon um, whatever they had missionaries they would send me. I had to go to Turkey to a place called Eskishihir uh, to help a team there. And I went to Sudan to help a team there and South Africa and uh, Morocco, just all sorts of different places. Um, and that really was what opened up. And then I met a guy called Jay Fox in 2000 um, in a place called the Isle of Skye. They were doing a little convention thing over there. And um, we um, that's where, of course, I met you and your team. And uh, the rest history, as far as our 
our connection has been a con uh, big concern. And we've gone to, Mon is it Mongolia we went together? No, we went yeah. To Mongolia. Mongolia. Yeah. yeah, great. So and you, know, so, yeah. you think about, you know, how one, one action leads to another action then opens up, you know, just a, an amazing life of trusting and walking with Jesus. I mean, when you think about reading the gospel of John and hearing those words, any branch in me that does not bear fruit is cut off and cast into the fire. And, and, and then all of a sudden it clicks, it becomes red hot. You yeah. hear the truth and the truth penetrates the overlay of our distractions or our distortions or our delusions. And then all of a sudden it brings real change in our hearts and there's probably no way in 1977 you would have been able to say you would have been all over the world preaching and proclaiming and really the gospel, but really fishing for men. I mean, that's exactly what Jesus did. He made you a fisher of men. And yeah. though you go in and a lot of times you're, you're ministering to the church, I've seen you really speak words of, of life and of hope and of truth into unbelievers' lives as well. And, and, and they have those same experiences, things that they hadn't considered, or maybe they had grown up in the church, but had never really surrendered to Christ. All of a sudden, as a result of the word being spoken, it shifted something and it changed them forever. I mean, this is, this is what God does, isn't it? Oh, uh, it's just amazing. You know, there's one nation I'll, I'll remain nameless at the moment. And, um, but the, 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 in this one particular city, it, the, their church was made up of people. And at that time, it would have been about 90, 90 over 90 percent, the people would have been HIV positive, all out of bed, uh, sharing needles mm -hmm. and stuff, you know, lots of drug. And, and they would have all they would have three or four drug uh, rehab centers. And I would go to this place, get into a car, and I would go from rehab center to rehab center. And I would be faced with 15, 20 people, some men, some women, and I'd be praying for them and seeking God, you know, and just, just praying for them and prophesying over them. Well, some of them are pastors today. Some of them are leading worship today. Some of them are are doing great things. Some of them are running businesses. Some of them are multiplying churches, you know, and it's, it's just, you know, it's like what John 15 says, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible for obvious reasons. Um, but Jesus speaks of bearing fruit, more fruit, much fruit, and then there's fruit that remains. Mm. And that's what Jesus wants to see. He wants there to be fruit that remains because that's the how the kingdom is advanced in the world today when you find people broken in absolute pieces you know um, i remember seeing this girl one time she was in the kitchen she didn't join with the rest of the group and i watched her you know she just hid in the kitchen and i went and i got her and i brought her into the crowd and prayed over her bleached hair not looking very well and you know and then it was 20 years later that we were celebrating in this church just all that god had done it was from the birth of the church mm. and i'm looking at this this board with all these pictures i said i remember praying for all these people and this girl was there and then i looked up on the platform and there she was her hair was dark naturally and here's her standing on the platform i said hey I remember the day I prayed for you. Now leading, helping to lead a church in another city. Fruit wow. that remains. Amen. And that's, I believe, is what the Lord is looking for in all our lives. Yeah, that's great, Joe. You know, we only have about a minute left, but what I wanted to ask you to do, there are people watching this show today. They may have been in the same situation as you, you know, having gone to church, you know, it's a religious act but they've never really had that encounter with Christ. But today hearing your story, I think it sparks something. It, it causes us to really recognize that there's more, that God wants to do more. He wants to reveal himself. And, 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 and in essence, he, he's doing it. He's actually doing it through yeah. your words right now. And so 
could you just maybe pray for those that are watching and have never really said yes to Jesus, that this would be the opportunity for uh, them to actually come to that place of realization and, and experience. Could you do it right now? Yeah, I will. Yeah. Hey, folks, listen, Jesus is the answer. If he can take a, 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 a young guy like me, an, a fisherman rough as anything, and change my life. He can change your life. And there's someone out there who's taken one or two steps towards the Lord, but you've never actually stepped over the line, so to speak, and opened up your heart to give your heart to Jesus. There's some other people that have got stuck. COVID has made you stuck, but you've been stuck for other reasons. Jesus wants you to open up your heart again. And there's some people there scratching their heads maybe, no, not knowing where they're going to go, what they're going to do with their life. Jesus is your answer, and he's the only answer. Let me pray for you today, wherever you are at in Tennessee and beyond. Father, I pray for everyone listening today, and I release your grace over those that are maybe stepping in but never come fully into your kingdom. Those who have never known you, Lord, those who have got stuck on their journey because of fears and COVIDs and any other thing that may have gone on in their life. Father, I'm asking you today in Jesus' precious name to set them free. And Jesus, manifest your love in homes that are listening right now. Jesus, would you breathe upon people? Just take a moment. And let Jesus breathe upon you this today in Jesus' name. Thank you. Let him breathe upon you and breathe in. When Jesus exhales, you inhale and receive the life. That's what it says in John's gospel in chapter 20. He breathed on his disciples. That brought them out of their unbelief and their fear and their despondency as he breathed life into them. Yes. Let God breathe life into you today. And I bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. And I release the power of the Holy Spirit to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, if you'd like prayer, there's a number that you can see at the bottom of the screen. You can call that number right now. There's somebody there that would like to talk to you. And so I just want to say to uh, Joe, thanks for being here. Thank you for uh, spending some time sharing with this group. Also, uh, those that are watching, if you need to email, there's a, the email address right there as well. God bless you. We're going to be here next week. And until that time, be blessed in Jesus' name. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you.